Ning Laba, welcome to MI Radio's Myanmar Today, where we bring you the latest news and reports from around Myanmar. I am Henry Zin. First off, we have Pidang Zulutor's discussion on Public Finance Cooperation Committee findings. Another report on Kachin State Business Forum that took place in the past few days. A story coverage on 48 Shan farmers receiving good agriculture practice certificates. And lastly, a report on Everyday Justice, Art, Films, Stories, Exhibition. Well, before we get to the reports, why don't we have a look at what's happening in local news. Ministry of Health and Sports has received a modern whole genome sequencing machine which can determine complete genome sequence for a given organism at one time. The $25,000 worth of Illumin ISAC 100 machine was donated by the University of Otago, New Zealand, Myanmar Chamber of Commerce and the Capital Diamond Star Foundation. Union Minister Dr. Mien Tui explained the effectiveness of the machine in determining the order of all nucleotides in a certain genome and detecting any variations relative to a reference genome using bioinformatics analyses. The Union Minister also requested New Zealand to do more multi-centric collaborative research works with Myanmar universities and research departments. The implementation of Agribusiness Service Centre (ASC) projects will begin in Ayawadi, Yangon, and Mandalay regions and Rakhine State, according to a press statement issued by the Myanmar Rice Federation. The four projects will pull in investments of 140 million US dollars, and they are slated to be completed in the 2020 to 2021 fiscal year, according to the federation. The MRF, the China International Trust Investment Corporation Group, and the Myanmar Agribusiness Public Corporation signed a cooperation agreement for the ASC projects last Friday at the Park Raya Hotel in Nebidor. The centers will be constructed in 10 states and regions. The consortium submitted a $400 million proposal to the Myanmar Investment Commission to construct 33 centers in states and regions. It is also seeking contracts for international loans and local investments, according to the MRF. A large number of tourists have been entering Bagan in the beginning of the high season to catch a glimpse of historical temples in the backdrop of breathtaking sunsets in the ancient city, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The famous Bagan sunset views can be observed from six places, the Nyaunlap Pagan viewpoint, the artificial hill close to Salamanit Temple, the Tangthu Hill, and Minathu Village viewpoints are packed with visitors hoping to catch the sunset. In the high season, horse riding businesses, motorcycle and electric bike rental businesses, hotels, motels, and guest houses are earning well, along with souvenir businesses. Those businesses create jobs for local residents. During the high season from November to April, Bagan is packed with local pilgrims and tourists. Shwebida Housing Project, which is located at number 19, Wengaba Ward, is 60% complete and the houses will be available by the end of December, according to the Paul May Ain Social Development Association. Community housing projects are being built in Laindaya, Shwebida, Dagon, South, North and East and Dagon Sekan Townships. About 10,000 houses will be built in each township. The construction inputs will also be provided for those housing projects. For implementation of the housing projects, Port May Ain Social Development Association has surveyed the population lists, including those who live in the squatters and dormitories. That's all with the local news, and here's the first report on Myanmar today. According to the findings of Public Finance Cooperation Committee, the construction of educational buildings under the project of the Ministry of Construction have some issues in construction completion and tender process as well. Bidang Zuluto, representatives discussed on this issue on Friday. Williamson will tell us more about that. For the fiscal years of 2018 and 2019, the Ministry of Education started to construct new schools in all over the country wherever it is needed to build. Public Finance Cooperation Committee conveys research on current status of construction and its quality along with how the Ministry of Education receive and pay private companies which pass tender process for the construction of the new buildings. Therefore, several Bidongzu Lodda representatives discussed the findings of Public Finance Cooperation Committee on 15 of November when the second time Bidongzu Lodda, the 14th regular meeting, was held on its fifth day. 
Speaking at Pirang Sulada meeting, U Teng Tung, Lada representative from Chang Kong constituency said, in constructing of the basic infrastructure of a nation, constructing required basic infrastructure for the educational purpose by the Ministry of Education has been one of the most important projects. At the same time, it is also huge in quantity and requires huge amount of money. As the construction is carried out for educational purpose, the construction project must be completed in time. At the same time, it must also meet the criteria of a good infrastructure, as there are some educational buildings which are no longer safe for use, it is worrisome for the kids. However, according to the report of the Public Finance Corporation Committee, the number of buildings to construct in the fiscal year of 2018-19 is 5,138, but the report also states that 2,881 of the buildings are yet to be commenced. However, due to change of fiscal year in last year and increasing salary for the government employees, the construction for the remaining building has not been commenced. Even though there is fact-finding committee for the construction for both education and healthcare, there is weakness in inspecting the quality of the construction for both education and healthcare in my constituency. So I request to give the project to the locals as they can build quality buildings than some of the tender past construction companies. According to the discussion at Piransud Lada, due to late agreement signing between the responsible officials from the government side and the tender past companies, many schools buildings commence the construction which later cause this order once the school is open. At the same time, there are not enough qualified persons in constructing the buildings, raising her concerns on quality of construction for school, Dr. Kin C. Du, Florida representative for Lloyd Gok constituency said, <laughs> In the tender process for building, educational building, there are nine qualifications which require to pass tender. However, these tender past companies don't work with best of their intention for the sake of public service but the quality of the construction is poor. This is why though the report says that around 90% of the project for the fiscal year of 2018 and 19 has been completed, we see several buildings poorly finished especially in the remote area, the quality of the construction are very poor. It shows there is weakness in QC quality control team and there were times when we had to fetch QC team for the inspection of the quality. Therefore, we need to seriously consider on reforming rules and regulations for tenure process where we'll have fine and punishment for poorly performed project. At the same time, we also need to make sure that if the construction is not complete in a given time, there must be fine and punishment for lately finished construction. Above, we must put the rules and regulations into action effectively for smooth and transparent project. According to the report at Lotdom meeting, due to the delayed process in receiving tender and agreement signing between the tender pass companies and the related ministerial officials and lack of proper management there are 2881 building project yet to be commenced there are also some cases where the budget is projected more than required and it has to be sent back therefore it is suggested that the union government and the ministry of education should properly inspect above mentioned issues in carrying out educational building projects this is Williamson reporting for MI Radio. That's a report on Pidang Zulador's discussion on Public Finance Cooperation Committee findings. All right, it's time now to check on the weather forecast in Myanmar. During the day in Yangon, it will be sunny to partly cloudy and the skies will be clear at night. The temperature throughout the day will be in the 30s and there's an extremely low chance of rain for the day. And expect winds of up to 7 km per hour. In Nebido, it's nice with plenty of sunshine during the day, and the night sky will be clear. The temperature throughout the day will be in the 30s as well, and there's also a very low chance of rain for the day, and expect winds of up to 6 km per hour.
In Mandalay, mostly sunny during the day, but expect clear skies at night. The temperature throughout the day will be in the 30s, and there's really no chance of rain at all for the day, and expect winds of up to 7 km per hour. Stay with us, we have another report coming up, and then we'll have a look at the stocks and currency exchange rates. The first Gachin State Business Forum took place for two days on Friday and Saturday at the Gachin National Manao Park in Mijina. With the aim of going forward to the future sustainable business development, the forum was organized by Kachin Ethnic Entrepreneurs Association and was joined by government officials and public and private entrepreneurs and business owners. Thought us in reports. Kachin State Business Forum kicked off for the first time at Kachin National Manor Park of Mijina for two days, from 15 to 16 November. It was organized by Kachin Ethnic Entrepreneurs Association or Kachin Amusha Sud Pakapun Kash to encourage the business partnership and investment in the status of agricultural and livestock, conserving the sustainable natural resources, tourism, construction, traditional testings, and retail and wholesale development. The forum was attended by the Vice President of the Republic of the Union of Myanmar, U Henry Bantiu, Union Minister for Ethnic Affairs, Nai Union Minister for Hortis and Tourism, U Oma, Chief Minister of Kachin State Government, Dauda Ka'a, Chairman of Myanmar Ethnic Entrepreneurs Association, U Yose, Chairman of Cash, U Katainen, Government officials, the private entrepreneurs, and guests. After forming Myanmar Ethnic Entrepreneurs Association MEEA in 2018, the business forums are to be implemented in respective states and regions. <laughs> When such kinds of forums are organized, it is important to consider how to make the local businesses emerge, which can ensure the sustainable and continuous development regionally, and how to have the processes of how to do business within the legal framework. Hence, in the Union Level Forum, which will be held in 2020, we can make the sharing and the discussions supporting the development of Myanmar. For the foundation and sustainability of the Democratic Federal Union, we need to prioritize the national reconciliation and peace processes so we can witness the development and peace are inseparable. So when we make the business policies of the country, we aim to make it the inclusive and continuous development. We also intend to perform the business framework which will be the support for the national reconciliation and which is to conserve the natural resources and to share among the states and regions. So we need to try to fundamentally in all aspects, including the business for the foundation of the future democratic federal union. Professor Dada Aung that who is serving as the patron of MEEA also talk about the objective of the forum. Uh, we had uh, some few objectives of forming this kind of business world. But we'd like to encourage people uh, to look into how we can work together closely. Uh, we want to establish partnership between the private sector and the government. Because it's important that the government and the private sector uh, uh, relate to one another, uh, connect to one another. We also want to encourage the private, uh, the civil society, the NGOs, because they should be part of this partnership. So we have three uh, types of partners, the government, uh, the private sector and the civil society. So the forum, the objective is to get all the three partners together so that they can share their concerns, the issues. Now, regarding this particular forum in, in, in Michina, so what is important is the private sectors you see themselves as actors to promote peace. That will be very important. MEEA is encouraging the ethnic people to be able to implement sustainable business development and to be inclusive all the partnerships for it. Well, eventually we want the uh, association to be a strong partner with the government. Uh, to promote uh, prosperity, to promote peace, 
and to promote sustainable development. In the forum, some entrepreneurs displayed the booths of local products and other goods. The vice president and the officials observed the booths and encouraged the entrepreneurs. That's of all now. This is Dora Swissin from MI Radio. That's a report on the Kachin State Business Forum. Here we have the information on currency rates from Myanmar Central Bank. One US dollar is at 1,514 juts. One Chinese renminbi is at 215 juts. One euro is at 1,669 juts. One pound sterling is at 1,950 juts. One Singapore dollar is at 1,112 juts. One Malaysian ringgit is at 364 juts. One Thai baht is at 50 juts, and the Indian rupee is at 21 juts. Gold is trading at 1,465 dollars. Silver is at 16 dollars. And brand crude oil is at $57. On the Yangon Stock Exchange, FMI went up 500 and it's now at 12,000. MTSH remains at 3,900. MCB is at 8,200. FPB is at 22,500. TMH remains at 3,000. You're with MI Radio's Myanmar today. You can log on to our website at miradio.com.mm and catch many other great programs of MI Radio live on the website. We're also running on FM 96.1 in Yangon, 96.5 in Manali, and 96.7 in Nibido. Alternatively, you can download our app on both iOS and Android platforms. It's easy to search. Just type in Myanmar INTL Radio and you'll find the app. Download it on your devices so you can listen to our radio programs on the go. Stay with us as we bring you more reports on Myanmar today. 48 farmers across Shan State received Good Agriculture Practice Certificates last week at Aumban's Hotel SS. Metro Wholesale Myanmar and the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock and Education last year provided trainings to the farmers across Shan State and Magui region. Agacho has more. Myanmar is gradually catching up with the safety norms and good practices in the agricultural sector. 48 farmers across Shan State received Good Agriculture Practice GAP certificates on the 14th of November at Aumban's Hotel Assas. Metro Wholesale Myanmar and the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock and Irrigation last year gave trainings to over 200 farmers across Shan State and Magui region. Of 200 farmers, 62 showed compliance and got GAP certified, of which the majority, 48, are from the Shan State, which is often dubbed as country's future agricultural powerhouse. Uzo Myaton, Assistant District Officer of the Agriculture Department of Shan State, said 30% of Myanmar's GDP comes from the agricultural sector and it makes up 25% of export products. So it's a very crucial sector for the country's economy. The government has been raising awareness to the farmers on the importance of good agriculture practice which ensures food safety and safe practices in growing and producing agricultural products. The trainings for the farmers to get closer to the good practice started since 2018, and this will be of great help in bringing better yields and benefits for the farmers' population. Since 2016 and 2017, we started giving GAP certificates to the farmers who grow tomato and other crops. The certificates were also given in 2017 and 2018, and we are also giving this year as well. We give the GAP certificates only once a year, and the most important thing is that they need to keep the proper record of their practices on the farm and our staff also help them monitor the use of practice on the farm. The duration of crops varies like some crops are harvested within three months while some for six months or a year. So our department tries our best to help them get certified on time. Good agricultural practice GAP are specific methods when applied to agriculture which create food for consumers or further processing that is safe 
and wholesome. While there are numerous competing definitions of what must constitute good agricultural practice, there are several broadly accepted schemes that producers can adhere to. The recently GAB certified farmers from Shen State mainly grow garlic, potato, and tomato. The farmers come from Kalo, Bindia, Nangdia, and Nyangshui. Metro Hosei Myanmar CEO Mr. Jans Michel explained. So we are sourcing um, directly here in Ongbang. We have actually established a collection center here in Ongbang. So we come a lot closer to the source. And from there we go and buy directly from the farming communities here. And out of our collection center in Ongbang, we then transport it in our uh, vehicles to uh, our TLRSZ facility. Among the farmers who attended the event, U Chiton, garlic farmer from Nyangshui Sad. I am very delighted to receive the GAP certificate today for we farmers comply with the standards of the GAP. For farmers, the food safety and GAP criteria are important and the GAP helps us in implementing the technology and ensure safety from growing, harvesting to storing and transferring the agriculture products. And we become more confident in selling our products at better price as the quality improves. We can utilize the GAP standards in farms, either big or small. And we become more confident in selling our products at better price as the quality improves. We can utilize the GAP standards in farms, either big or small. We need to create a system which ensures the full safety on our farms and we need to prove how we implement the system in practice. The GAP ensures the agriculture equipment are clean and to improve the hygiene and quality of the water management and land condition as well as the packaging. This is Agajo reporting for Myanmar International Radio. As a report on 48 Shan farmers receiving good agriculture practice certificates. And here's the last report on Everyday Justice Art Films Stories Exhibition. Well-known contemporary Myanmar artists joined together with My Justice to encourage ordinary people to reflect on what justice means and what role they play in seeking it. The Everyday Justice exhibition has been launched in the newly renovated Tourist Burma building on Friday. David Tanner will tell us more. The exhibition is part of an event to mark the achievements of My Justice and its partners since the program began in 2015. Funded by the European Union and implemented by the British Council, My Justice promotes access to justice in Myanmar by raising awareness of people's legal rights, improving justice service through a network of justice centers, and strengthens both community efforts to resolve disputes and justice policy reforms. We'll be hearing out about the detail of My Justice achievements and its journey from EU Ambassador to Myanmar, HE, Mr. Christian Skumit. Well, this has been a great success. Uh, for four and a half years, uh, My Justice has been uh, delivering justice to people uh, in vulnerable positions. Um, opening a discussion that, of course, in many aspects is, is painful but needed for a country in transition uh, like Myanmar. It is too good to stop. It is uh, important, it's necessary, there's a lot of work that still needs to continue. So after four and a half years of my justice, we have decided uh, today uh, to continue with another four and a half years and the European Union will um, grant another uh, 20 million euros to continue this program. My Justice deliver activities in six regions or states and across 64 townships in Myanmar in cooperation with over 50 local and international non-governmental organizations and in close with the government's coordinating body for justice sector affairs and the Union Legal Aid Board. To date, My Justice support has led to the 21,000 people receiving free legal assistance, 3,333 mediators trained in how to resolve disputes 
fairly. First of all, we'll continue and expand the uh, legal aid centers. Um, they are really delivering justice to the people on the ground and we need more and we need them in, in all regions of, of Myanmar. Um, obviously, uh, conflict is still continuing. Injustices are still being committed. Uh, and so it is more than just dealing with the past. It's dealing with cases that are occurring every single day. Uh, so we feel that we have a model here that needs to be uh, broadened out and made available. This is a, a program that is uh, not dealing with changing the constitution or the stories that are in the headlines. Let me assure you that the European Union deals with those issues also, um, including uh, very famous cases that have been before the courts. They are followed very closely by the European Union. Uh, but this program has been looking at the vulnerable groups, people who don't have the means to pay a lawyer, who don't have access uh, to courts, who don't understand their rights. Um, and, and so uh, it, it is a, a program that addresses, of course, the most vulnerable groups. My justice research confirms that few people in Myanmar trust the formal justice system to respond to their needs or feel able to claim their rights, while some seek justice where they can find it. Changing this relationship between people and the system requires reflecting on people's experiences of seeking justice and visualizing alternatives and possibilities. With that said, Caitlin Rager, the team leader of My Justice, told MI Radio about the possibility expansion of justice centers and the circumstances. Currently, there's 12 justice centers operating in six states and regions around the country. Uh, we hope potentially to expand them, but we also want to make sure that the current ones are supported to expand the numbers of people that they can serve, the numbers of townships, and work together with networks of local lawyers in those areas as well. So we have not yet decided where and how many to expand to. That will be decided at the, at the beginning of the second phase. I have also asked her for what are the challenges in working working on the justice for people in Myanmar and their experiences. The challenges of promoting justice in Myanmar, I think, is first that uh, you have a big population and many of the services still don't reach everybody. You also have some very old laws uh, that need updating and sometimes it's also mindsets from the past that people fear going to the justice system. They prefer to try to keep things out of uh, of a formal system. All of those are challenges, but none of them are impossible to overcome. So have been supporting many organisations that have paralegals who go out into the community on motorbikes into remote villages and help people get documentation, help them to register their land and help them to resolve disputes. Uh, we train community leaders on, on dispute resolution to help maintain uh, justice in many ways at local levels. Reporter David Tanner reporting from Myanmar International Radio. And that's all the reports on Myanmar today. Now let's carry on with international news. A cancer conference has hurt Cancer patients should tell their doctors if they are taking herbal products because some of the ingredients could stop their treatment working. Garlic, ginger and gingo pills, for example, can delay the healing of skin wounds when breast cancer spreads. Surgeon Professor Maria Joao Cardoso said there was no evidence that herbal therapies or creams worked. She said if in doubt, it was best not to take anything. She said it was particularly important that patients always check with their doctors first before trying complementary therapies for cancer that had spread to the skin. This happens in one in five cases of breast cancer and less in other cancers. Resident Evil 2 has been named as the ultimate game of the year at the Golden Joystick Awards. The remake of the 1998 game takes place in the middle of a zombie apocalypse and was praised by critics and players. The awards, which took place in London, are significant because they are mainly voted for by the public. More than 3.5 million votes came in for 19 of the 24 categories in the award ceremony's 37th year. Gaming legend Yu Suzuki, who spent decades at SEGA, but has more recently developed mobile games, won the lifetime achievement. A British inventor who calls himself Jetman has broken his own record for the fastest flight in a jet suit. Richard Browning took off from Brighton Beach in an attempt to break his previous record of 32.02 miles per hour set in 2017. 
He said before the flight he was hoping to show how technology used in the suit had progressed since the previous record was set. He was more than 50 miles per hour faster than his previous record, hitting 85.06 miles per hour, according to Guinness World Records. Well, that's going to wrap it up on today's Myanmar Today. Thank you for joining me. I am Henry Zin.